that I really don't need to. So I'm going to talk about some family members and uh, quite honestly you probably wish they'd been orphans and never had any. The first one is actually from a personal perspective. 31st of May 2010. I got a cab outside my in-laws and I paid the cab driver and he seemed distracted. He gave me the wrong change. I didn't I looked at him, I thought there was a problem. I didn't realise that he had problems with his tax and that two days later he would go on to kill 12 people and injure 11 before killing himself because this was Derek Bird, the cab driver in Whitehaven. During that time he drove past my nephew's school and stopped and he ended up being close to where my father-in-law was who'd gone on walkabout for two hours we desperately trying to find my father-in-law and this was caused by the paranoia uh, that Derek felt uh, that he's been betrayed by his twin the first person he killed he shot him 11 times now that's personal now how does paranoia affect you well you've only got to look at Richard Nixon and his brother and this paranoia spiralled and became Watergate and beyond. And it was down to um, his concern that in 1957, Howard Hughes had lent his brother Donald £205,000 to bail out Donald's California restaurant, which actually went bankrupt without the, within the year. And then in 1972, John Meyer, via Howard Hughes, started feeding Donald's misinformation uh, that the Democrats that year were, were bound to win and uh, there was a desire to prove that the, desire, the Democratic national chairman, it was Larry O'Brien, was working for Hughes. Um, and this led to getting people involved like uh, Hunt uh, to break it, who was renowned for breaking into places, that's why he done for, for years in the past, uh, to become, in, become involved. Um, and hence Watergate and beyond. It was later proven to the HSEE that in fact some of the campaign <coughs> contributions had actually been funneled through to Donald and Edward Nixon. Um, the veteran journalist Nancy Drew said last month, there's an airy parallel between what Trump is doing and what Nixon did. Ooh. But for our history, so surely the worst siblings are Lyndon Johnson and his sister, Josepha, because it was alleged in 1984 that Johnson had ordered the killings of her and 16 others. Um, killing your own sister, well, what has she done? Well, she had helped him in his Box 13 boat rigging way back. And in um, 1951, She'd been in a thespian group, I say thespian, but lesbian also comes into play here, with Doug Kinzer and Mary Andre Wallace. And Mary Andre Wallace was the wife of Mac Wallace. Now, Mac that's one sef had separated from his wife at one point and actually did go out with Josepha. And Josepha and Mary were bosom friends, literally. The vice squad raided Zyka Park in Austin, uh, where there were sex orgies taking part, and the bisexual Josepha, who'd allegedly worked in the brothel, uh, was involved with these. She was an alcoholic and a, a drug user, um, and is alleged that uh, via her next lover, Kinzer, both of them, that she tried to get money out of LBJ. And uh, as we all, I'm sure we know, that Mac Wallace um, borrowed an FBI gun and uh, stupidly, using his own car, he goes in and shoots uh, Kinzer at the, at the miniature golf course which he had. Now at the trial, it's, uh, 11 of the jurors wanted the death penalty, one wanted life. However, as we know, he got off with a suspended sentence and was <laughs> free. Now, what we do know is that some of the jurors phoned Doug Hinz's family to apologise and said that they'd received death threats. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Lyndon B. Johnson had incredible power at the time. He, 
he then went on to get Wallace, you know, positions within the government. This is a effectively <laughs> a killer. Now, how did Josepha die? Well, she'd been at a Christmas Eve party at uh, Linda B. Johnson's. Wow, that must have been quite a party. What she'd done during that? I mean, we all have problems at Christmas, but. 11.45, she left her at uh, Christmas Eve. By 3.15, who was there at 3.15 to know she was dead? Isn't that suspicious? A doctor who was not present wrote her death certificate and said she'd had a brain hemorrhage. How she would know when there was no op autopsy, despite that being state law. Now, she was embalmed on Christmas Day and buried on Boxing Day. Now, Boxing Day seldom is this term seems more appropriate. And I don't think Lady Bird was crying either because she had been l using her own money to help uh, with Lyndon's family members. They were always asking her for, for money. Now, the, the four words that Lyndon tended to use, and I've heard this from several people, was get rid of him. Or get rid of her, in this case. He didn't want to follow up and find out how it was going to be done. Um, I don't know how in this instance whether she was suffocated, poisoned, I, well, I guess we'll never know. But um, was Mac Wallace involved in 63? Well, Glenn Sample, the researcher, found out that he, he wasn't at work at that day. And certainly there are, he fitted the description of uh, somebody that was seen near the TSBD. Whether he was at on the sixth floor, or whether he was at the grassy knoll, we don't know. But you always, I, I believe, as researchers, need to work out where this source came from. Is it reputable? This is an allegation, after all. It was in a letter uh, when Billy Sol Estes was trying to do a plea bargain. Um, and um, it was via a lawyer called Doug Caddy. Now, let's look into Doug Caddy. He was, the Watergate, he was the lawyer for the Watergate burglars. The reason, bar, the reason why was that he had had a friendship with Howard Hunt because both of them had worked for the Mullen Corporation in the 70s. Now, that's a CIA conduit. So, um, it's 1960, in fact, the same lawyer had started the Young Americans for Freedom um, Council with... Uh, Marvin Liebman and William Buckley and that council had um, 11 John Birch Society members so I'm very worried about Douglas Caddy himself okay. so the Watergate burglars, let's, let's look at Hunt I set, sent uh, my, oh, sorry, set myself various thoughts as to friends and family. And quite a point of fact, Hunt sort of fitted in quite a few places. If you've ever read about the Watergate because they did the most incompetent thing you've ever heard. They ought to film it as it actually happened. Um, it was it was completely farcical, and seemingly people that have worked with Hunt in the, in the past said that he was fairly incompetent with virtually everything he did. Um, he went to jail for 33 months and uh, was going bankrupt. And as I said, I, I always think that you need to look to see what people do after 63 and who support and who their friends are, and that will give you an idea of, of perhaps what was happening then. So look at, let's look at the godparents of Hunt's kids. Now don't forget, he's in jail for 33 months. He's got four kids. They, when he became, uh, he and his wife um, tr uh, converted <coughs> to Catholicism, the godfather was, for all three children, was William Buckley. Remember the same William Buckley? Who was the author of the National Review, and I think he did an atrocious job. He was, uh, for many years, a very respected journalist. He was uh, the son of a millionaire, but he did not come to their help and the kids' help. They got kicked out of their house and they, they had a, a terrible life. The other child, nine-year-old David, his godfather, he, I think he did worse, was Manuel Artimi. We all know Manuel. So Manuel came taken. He went to live in Florida 
and uh, Manuel uh, Truman was actually working for Trafficante and part of the drug ring by that time, and uh, had very wealthy um, people that he was selling to. So David Hunt, at a very early age, uh, became a dealer in cocaine and, and a drug, drug addict himself. So be wary. Now the reason that the poor old David had to go and live with Godfather was that Hunt's wife was killed in the plane crash in December 1972. It was going from Dallas to Chicago. It was United Airlines flight. There was a problem as they were coming into Chicago with the right runway marker lights. They struck the trees. Uh, three of the flight crew were killed, 40 of the 55 passengers. Um, people have always thought it was very suspicious because, and um, there's a good reason for this, including Hunt, was that 50 FBI agents suddenly ra raced to, in even the NTSC when they were looking into that, thought it was very suspicious that so many FBI agents should be available. What, when I was researching it, I found out that Bill Man Hunt is in prison. He had to recognise his wife from, not from photos, but from her jewellery. Did she actually even die? <coughs> we know that uh, Dorothy had, had also been, as is usually the case um, with intelligence people, they often marry within the intelligence community. It's not unusual at all who you speak to. Um, she'd been formerly CIA. She was working as a paymaster at the time. She had $2 million worth of money orders, etc., on her because she was acting to pay the families of the Watergate burglars. And do we think that's suspicious? Of course we do. Now, who else died? Marcia Clark. No, not OJ's Marcia Clark. The CBS reporter. Um, she was supposed to have various th things and she'd interviewed people. It's a bit like Dorothy Kilgallen. She'd interviewed people. She was cremated against her family's orders and her mortician was murdered short, shortly after. So, there we go. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, another spouse couple in intelligence. William and CJ Harvey, that's Clara Grace Harvey. Uh, they or originally met and they were working for the FBI and then both uh, Bill and um, CJ, as she was always called, then moved to the CIA. But my favourite story about them is in January 95, uh, sorry, 1951, the party from hell, it was called. It was uh, held by Kim Philby in Washington. He'd been here since 1949. And as we know, William Harvey was an alcoholic and CJ wasn't far behind. She got increasingly noisy during the, the day and she was complaining about the cold English roast beef. Thought it was absolutely disgusting. By the time they got to the Scotch, things were truly getting out of hand. There was a, a mixture of FBI and uh, CIA people, most renowned being um, Jim and Cicely Angleton. And one of the guys there does admit that they were talking shop, which concerns me. Obviously, they're talking in front of Kim Philby. And um, so CG asked if Guy Burgess would do a sketch of her, because he, he was renowned for being quite a good artist. And he actually did, and there are places where you can read about how descriptive it was. It was very pornographic, um, as you can imagine. And Bill Harvey had to be restrained. He was furious. And it's thought that this is one of the reasons that um, Bill Harvey then turned his attention even more to Kim Philby. <coughs> And, you know, I can, I can remember the tales from reading about British intelligence where, when um, Bill Harvey was there arguing, you know, that Philby was definitely um, an agent. Because a few months later, Burgess and McLean deflected in the May. But British intelligence just in, ignored this. And Hoover ignored, ignored William Harvey for a long time. Harvey continued to be a man who was incredibly angry with everybody for not listening to him, and most of the time he was right. This is a man that then goes on to uh, recruit the mob into the Z 
that are rifled, the assassination plans. And uh, it becomes so friendly with Johnny Roselli that his daughter calls her Roselli Uncle Johnny. And uh, what is the worst thing you, you would do? Well, obviously, he argued very much, and he was getting more alcoholic, so that Bobby Kennedy thought it would be a great idea to send him to Rome as uh, chief of station. Italy, you send somebody to the head of the mafia, a, a ridiculous place to go. But um, although they tried to say that he stayed in Rome, in fact, there's incidences you know, when he was in Mexico and he continued being involved um, in, uh, in plans right up to October. 90 and November 63. Now, I have always believed my, I might change my belief over about LBJ over the year, never ever change my belief that um, for me, William Harvey was what I'm going to call him as the logistics commander. I don't think he was the instigator, I don't think he was the mastermind, but he was one of the few people who had, despite his alcoholism, the brains to actually get the people into place at the time. This is something he'd been doing for decades, and boy was he angry, and he had all the right connections. Now I'm going to go on to a cousin, and bear in mind what's been said today, the most important cousin, and that's Oswald's cousin, Marilyn Moret. And I do apologise, because my surname was Beret, and her surname was Moray, and um, I, mine was Miss pronounced, but I will continue incorrectly with the anglicised version of it. She was born in 1928, and research has really haven't got very far, and I've only started recent researching her, and the more I do it, the more I realise just how important she is. There's a lot of, people say, oh, you know, her, her Oswald is, you know, great friendly, he's great friendly. Well, this is, this is, I think hogwash. There's no, I can find no proof that Oswald and Marilyn were great friends. There's 11 years between them, and what, so that means when Oswald was 10, she was already 21. When you're a kid, even two years makes a difference. Get beyond two years. However, I, the black sheep of my family is my cousin, a serial gigolo who's been married three times to elderly women, and if they get any older, he's going to have to dig them up. So, <laughs> I do appreciate that, you know, we, we, all, we all have problems. Uh, and I, my other cousin, I have another cousin who's 11 years older than me, and uh, although I didn't have much to do with her when I was young, I idolised her. Um, when she got engaged to uh, a librarian, I then spent the next nine years wanting to be a librarian. I suspect that's the sort of relationship that Oswald had with Marilyn. And there's one line. Remember when the, somebody said she had a, he might have Asperger's? Look at her Warren Commission statement. He was perfectly content with being the way he is. And think in the context of that. To me, it said, and I'd always had a query of it, the way he is, the way he is, perhaps that's what she was trying to say. And I, I just read um, her descriptions of him, because this is somebody who truly knew him for, for a long time. You know, he lived with the family when he was young, he was a, and he was an adorable little boy, by all accounts. He thought he was, ex he, he thought he was extremely intelligent. He, he was more intelligent than his grades indicated. He would read encyclopedias like someone would read a novel. I think that tells us a lot. He was quiet, refined, well-mannered. This, I have another query of it. Very erect in his walk. I'm not quite sure what she's trying to say there. But... The reason that I think we should all be suspicious of Marilyn is that this is a woman, 35, who is a single woman and um, says she's a teacher and, and goes all around the world. Where does she get the money? Why is she going? It's ridiculous. 
So New Zealand, Australia, Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaya, Japan, 61, India, Pakistan, back through Europe, July and August 63, Mexico. So I looked more and found her on passenger mass manifolds. Bermuda, Florida, this is just one year. Bermuda, Florida, Belgium, Amsterdam, New York, etc. Where is she getting the money to do this? It's all incredibly suspicious. Excuse me, now, Jean, Jean, is she Charles Murray's daughter? Yes. All right, the, the bookie? Yes. All right, okay. Yeah. She's one of the, uh, the, the New Orleans kids. So I mistakenly had always thought that she was an English teacher. Anybody know what she did her degree? <laughs> it was in, if I can find it, it was in, uh, I, I actually did find a, a, a Loyola. She did it in medical technology. I looked up in 46 exactly what that was. It was lab science. It's now called lab science. Uh, it, empirical biological science, organic chemistry, and microbiology, and uh, it's called the lab, lab tests, detection, diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of disease. And that I looked at the professors who were teaching and what their um, specialities were, and it was at forensics and, and looking at, at diseases. The MD professor at MedTech at the time was a James Goday. I don't know how common Godet is. But in 1975, the CIA's William Godet, remember he of the Mexico ticket, told Bernard Fensterwald, the attorney, Marilyn may have worked for the, way, the agency in New Orleans. Really? I wonder why. Now, if you look at when Jenna <coughs> is questioning her and asking her where she went to university, this is where my goes off the chart. She gets stopped, she's listing, and she would have continued, you can see. Loyola University, LSU, which is in Baton Rouge, Duke, University of California, the Sorbonne, University of Madrid, St. Louis University. <coughs> she was stopped at this place, at that point. What the heck? They all cost money to go to. Now, the likes of the Sorbonne, uh, there's four research uh, organizations, uh, obviously the, the based, based on Pierre and Marie Curie, and it's very medical based. <coughs> then you've got Duke, she was three months in the summer school. Now this is a private research university in California. They only let the creme de la creme even attempt to get into this. Um, likewise, you know, obviously the Sorbonne, the University of Madrid, where, where she was three months. What was she doing? I, I can't tell you. I can. I, I just think it's so highly suspicious. She was detained in East Berlin for 12 hours at one point for unspecified reasons. Now, if you actually look at the family, you find one of her brothers uh, was a pharmacist and the other brother also was a dentist. And then we have the, the Jesuit. Um, now, in night, when her part, first passport uh, was released in 1944 on the application, she put that she was a reservations officer for Banff Airlines. And remember what her degree is in, and that she's worked in science. Why would she be working, for goodness sake, as a reservations officer for Banff Airlines? Now, I'm sure I remember somebody else, I remember who worked for Banff Airlines, and somebody had a very interesting uh, research. Does anybody know who that is who lived in New Orleans? They vary in my opinion. Now 54 seems to be the point when she truly whiz starts whizzing off around the world. She also mentions at some point and when she's talking about Oswald how much she liked the Civil Air Patrol. I do not find it, I really think the fact that she's working for an airline very is involved with, that she's interested, presumably, in all this research, which is, if we believe Judith Fairy Baker, etc., is exactly the sort of stuff that Oswald was in, you know, and Ferry <coughs> were so interested in, that perhaps it was via 
Marion, Marilyn, that um, worked with the airlines or vice versa, that um, might have then got the introduction of Oswald to Ferry. I don't think that's beyond um, belief. Might have got her free travel though. She worked yeah, for an airline. Absolutely, but there is no sense for this single woman to be going to all these countries at a time. It's just it, you, it just takes common sense. Now, in 1964, there was um, an article by Paul Scott, the journalist. Um, it was has been thought of later that this this was put through by James Angleton that um, Marilyn was a defector and that this defector thing ran in the family. Um, and they did release some of her details about what she'd put on her, her passport application, which she'd lied at, by the, by the way. Um, she'd put her, pe on both passports, 1954, 1957, she'd got her parents' um, dates of birth from, which is exactly what Oswald had done on his applications as well, the, the, the CIA thing. The CIA did admit they had a file of overt source material about her. They've never really come clean um, about. Now, whether in January 64, Angleton, I, I, I don't know, I believe that the agencies were in war. They were trying to blame culture. The FBI was trying to blame the CIA. The CIA was trying to blame, I don't know if that's the, the, the case. But if we look at what... Um, Marilyn did in the years later, we find out that in 1966, she's in Haiti. Ooh, who's there at the same time? George de Marinschild. And then she goes to uh, the Dominican Republic. Well, who's the station chief then? David Atley Phillips. It's the Dominican Civil War, something I've researched a lot. A project I'm working on, a book. This is not somewhere that you are, are going to want to go. And the State Department, uh, the Francis Knight in the passport office, was very suspicious about this at the time. So, the, we truly, really don't at the moment know that much about Marilyn. I don't really think anybody has pushed hard to, to look into how much she's involved. That there was this idea that she's linked, and the phrase is that her name has been linked with uh, Professor Harold Isaacs of MO, MIT, uh, with the Research Centre for International Studies. Perhaps that was her base for all these countries she's visiting. Uh, he was a lecturer on China and thought of being a Trotskyist. Now, Harold's, remember I'm talking about family, Harold's first cousin was Charles Isaacs. This is the Chuck Isaacs, who it, researchers believe was mentioned being overheard and being talked about at Winnipeg Airport with the, the incident. And Chuck's second wife at the time was Jack Ruby's wardrobe designer. I, as I said, it's just been muted that she's been linked. But Charles Isaacs was also involved with the, I think he worked for American Airlines, so once again we have this airline connection. Um, so this is a, just a work in progress on Marilyn, I've only just started looking into it, but I, <coughs> I just get the feeling that um, she's the person that, that perhaps the conduit or the introduction between her and David Ferry, and obviously the new Orleans. Now, we do know that she lied, or once somebody lied, either Edward Pick lied, John Edward Pick lied, or she lied, and the Warren Commission didn't look into it, because if you remember, um, Pick says that Marilyn, who visited him in Japan, what is she doing in Japan? She visits his family in Japan and says that um, Oswald has gone to Russia before anybody knows about it. However, when you look at Marilyn's uh, Warren Commission, she blames it that she heard it, not from John Pick, but from John Pick's wife. Now, I think that's quite a clever ploy because John Pick's wife is, is not called... To testimony. So rather than blaming John Pick, isn't it better to blame 
blade in the wine, so to speak. Um, so we know one of them's lying. Um, let's the, let me see if there's anything else on the... Oh yes, so by the time she gets 1958, her second passport, she's by now listing herself as a teacher. Um, and, and once again, she, you know, as I said, she, she goes through all these countries. She, she, does, she only admits to teaching in New Zealand, and Austria and Japan. Um, and by the time she's interviewed, actually by the Warren Commission, uh, she's um, teaching at the high school that Edward Vogels used to go to. But then she said that he hasn't got paid for a few months. As I said, you cannot sustain all this travel and everything on this sort of sort of um, salary. So my final relative is an uncle. So I thought I'd choose um, Sylvia, I, you know me, I, you know I love Sylvia Adeo, her uncle, who was a physics professor at Xavier University in uh, New Orleans, Dr. Augustine Guitard, and uh, came over from Cuba in 1962. He taught for 27 years at the University of Havana. Um, and why is he interesting? Because we've heard earlier about Carl Springer and the fight, and the, you know, Oswald supposed got into this mark fight. Well, who was sitting alongside Oswald during that trial, who was shown to be, the photos prove, was standing out, not out, next to Carlos outside of this uncle. And I looked into it, and he was much more active than I'd ever given him credit for. He was with uh, Rescart, the uh, revolutionary underground movement. It wasn't Jura, it was Rescart. And he'd given lots of talks, um, and was <coughs> definitely great friends with Bringier. Um, the reason I'd always, because I mean, he, he was, it was interviewed over several years at different times by the FBI, but he said that the FBI, when they came to question him about Sylvia, were just like um, other people have said, they had been asked to, to find out if Sylvia was sound of mind not anything about whether she was involved with Jura and all those sorts of just whether she was a nutcase or not. This is the woman that uh, believes that Oswald visited her. Um, now, who ended up uh, for a time with Augustine Guitard was the priest, Walter McCann. And um, I, I don't know if you know the story about Walter McCann, but uh, he was in... Um, Dallas, and he disappeared um, shortly before the assassination. Actually, he was with his parents, but he, he just appeared, disappeared from his um, where he was uh, working. Um, he, he disappeared after the John Martino talk, which was given, uh, which was the sponsored John Birch talk promoting. Uh, Martino's, I was Castro's prisoner. Um, he left, uh, well, as I said, he was not seen after the 1st of October, and the FBI had quite a lot of trouble trying to track him down as to where he'd gone. Um, and it was, um, the, the suspicions were that he knew, or, or somebody had confessed to him in the confessional box, um, and he got scared when when Kennedy was said. The other theory that's going through is that perhaps he was the father of Sylvia O'Deo's child because Sylvia O'Deo was pregnant um, at the time of uh, the uh, assassination. And um, so I've always wondered who the father of that child was. My best culprits were either Father McGann, um, and there was a, 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 tri a love triangle, it's supposedly with Lucille Connell, Sylvia Rodeo, and Father McGann. I don't know. One, that would certainly make you want to run, but why would you end up staying with this woman's uncle in New Orleans? Or, possibly more likely, Morris Ferro, who later for many years was the mayor of um, 
Miami and um, the founder of the Orlando Bosch Day. And if you know anything about the, the terrorist Orlando Bosch, well, Morris actually, uh, during his uh, time there, brought about the Orlando Bosch Day. So, as I said, the uh, Augustine Qatar, to my opinion, knew far more uh, about what was happening and uh, his obviously very close relationship bear in mind this is Sylvia's uncle um, with Carlos Bringer also throws more into the equation of how closely related they are so rather not rather than keeping you too long I thought I'd just have a final word here and I'm I'm going to leave those words to the person I think who has the most right to speak up a why, why to give up, cover up the conspiracy and that was the other man that nearly died on that occasion John Connolly in July 1982 at a fundraiser for the congressman in New Mexico he turned to the communications director of that event Doug Thompson and Doug Thompson asked him, you know, why, why have you gone along with this for such a long time? And Connolly said, I love this country and we needed closure at the time. So I'll close. <laughs>
with the Red Cross, she could not be considered employable from an emotional standpoint. Was she ever? <laughs> so, what does he do? He goes to get his passport, as quickly as possible, goes to California, issued 10th of September. Now, the passports in those days were valid for two years, so until 1961. When you wrote your passport, you had to write down where you were expecting to go for those two years. The 11th of September, he was released from active duty. What I thought I'd do was look at what he wrote down as the places he was going and see where he was thinking of going. So, we can tell the first was Cuba. You can tell why he would put that because uh, he saw William Morgan who uh, was an American who became a commandant in Castro's forces. He thought he was a fabulous guy to follow. Mm. And don't forget, this is 59. Um, even uh, Time magazine is still pro-Castro at this time. It wasn't until January 61 that we cut off, they cut off uh, relations went through to 2017. He also puts down the Dominican Republic. Once again, his friend Nelson Delgado says that Oswald was keen that he wanted to help oust the dictator Trujillo, and there was a lot in the press at the time about the revolutionary force um, which Castro had su supported during the June. And Time magazine, we know that Oswald was a fan, uh, wrote a nice article about it in July. We can understand those people. Yeah? Where else? Germany. Well, perhaps because it's birthplace of Marx and Schweitzer. Um, <laughs> Oswald claimed he spoke a little German. Yeah. Uh, the main language of Switzerland. Did he attend Albert Schweitzer College? Nine. It, but more importantly, it's the gateway from west to east Berlin. This is the most common defect route. Now, this is his notebook. He's got West Berlin, FRG, Federal Republic of Germany, Tempelhof Dam, that is on the Berlin underground, the way that you would actually get into East Berlin. So I thought, wow, but perhaps he could have flown from LA, where he was, to Berlin. So I googled that, and what came up? The Oswalds. What? This is Gert, this is Marjorie, it just happened he's a filmmaker, uh, about to fly direct from LA to Berlin, so you could certainly do that flight, but it was about just under $300, quite a lot of money at that time. So, the yeah, he put that he was going to attend the Albert Schweitz College, flies in March, sends off his deposit, there's his application, the original date, 12th or April to June, which was later amended by the college, that's what the building looks like now. I'm not going to go into the annals of all about the Unitarian and all the rest of it. What nobody else has ever mentioned is this. He only paid his $25 deposit. Nobody ever mentions the fact, and if I take it from the ad at the time, he still had $908 to pay. <laughs> Where was going to get that money from? They never followed it. Nobody's ever written about that fact. Marguerite was informed in 1960 the deposit would not be repaid because it only barely cost their administrative costs. As we know, it never turned up. He also put down he was going to attend Turkey University. There's no evidence that he did. There's a picture of it at the time. It was one of the two summer schools in Finland that did um, he could have applied for. It had free tuition. It would have been cheaper until 2017. And if you applied, it was awarded on your application letter. So in my opinion, had he applied, he would have been accepted. So why summer schools? Well, he only had high school equivalency, which he had got through the Armed Forces Institute in that March, um, which meant that obviously he could apply for summer schools. But he was still in the military reserve until the 7th of December, the only way you could really legitimately get out of the country, because he was supposed to be stateside, was saying that he was going for higher education. Is that all he probably is. 
let's trace him on his journey. <coughs> California, Texas, Louisiana. Leaves LA, we're presuming by bus, it takes about 28 hours to get there. 2 a.m. on the 14th, he arrives <coughs> at Marguerite. He also has to register the selected service board. On the 15th, he spends the day with Robert Varda and the children. That is a photo taken on the 15th. He's holding his niece, Kathy. 16th, he goes back to Marguerite. Obviously not worried about her nose whatsoever. <laughs> he loans, in her terms, Marguerite $100. He then exits and says he's off to be a shipping clerk. Hello, well. Thus, we then presume, he's done it before, it takes about 10 hours to get to New Orleans. He visits the travel consultants for the okay. Right. Travel consultants, where are they? International Trademark. Oh, there he is, in August 63. He likes that building. He completes a passenger immigration questionnaire. This is on the 16th. He pays $220 to go one way to Le Havre. Lewis Hopkins, who is the guy, who is the manager who stayed there for years, said, had for the HSC uh, in um, 78, had I known he was planning to go up to Russia, I'd have suggested a different route. <coughs> now, this is my, where I found something. Okay, so the Liberty Hotel, which is described in 63 in the FBI document, is as an economy hotel. Um, the chap looked in his register as to when Oswald has registered. It is 5.10 p.m. on the 17th. Okay, missing an action. Where was Oswald on the evening of the 16th? We know he's in New Orleans. And I found a document saying that the FBI special in charge was aware of the dilemma. He said, oh, he probably resided at the Liberty Hotel, not verified. I triple checked this. The FBI really took this seriously. They, they took the register of the Southern Blue Printing Company. They took three copies of four pages. The, the, the bookings they looked at covered the whole period from the 6th to 25th of September. They then sent those photo stats to be handwriting analysed to make sure they were Oswald's. They were. So we know it was the 17th. He filled that on the 16th. As I said, suddenly we don't know where he is on that day. What was he up to? So, on the 19th, he sends this letter to Marguerite saying that he's booked a passage on the ship. Um, at 3.15, these passengers board in time to the marine like steamer uh, to get there for the 5 o'clock dinner. The following morning, 6.35 a.m., it departs. He's described as sullen and uncommunicative. He was a teenager, all teenagers are something I'm communicative, I'm sorry. And he tells them that he's going to attend school in Switzerland. Okie dokie. Now, what did he take? Okay, so we know he took one suitcase, according to his family and the quest passenger questionnaire. A few clothes, according to Billy Joe Lord. Mein Kampf and Das Kapital. A book. Oh, damn it, it is. A book borrowed from Martin's like church, it. which he never returned. And a grey suit bought in Japan 1957, later worn to his wedding, which has got his name embroidered in yellow thread. I put Paul would like that detail. Yes. Uh, the Warren Commission described it as poor fitting, but this poor fitting suit sold in 2018 for $15,600. Moth holes free of charge. So, they finally got to uh, France on the 5th of October at Dr. La Rochelle and Billy Joe Lord, the 18 year old student, got off the boat. On the 8th of October, 6.30 a.m., Dr. Kikrand, and finally got to La Havre <coughs> at lunchtime, <coughs> and then the other three passengers embarked. Now, I thought this was interesting. I've missed this for all my years. Lee had shared his travel <coughs> plan with Patricia McMillan Johnson on the 18th of November, 1959. They'd spent hours talking, and he told her he expected to fly from the half 
but didn't realise there wasn't an airport there. Don't forget, that's as far as he got with his prior booking, just the La Havre. And the Paris airport is 134 miles away. So he had to decide where he was going to go from there. So, what do we know? France to England. I've put the... These are actually the, the stamps from all the passports, etc. So, um, we're presuming that he, well, we, we know he took the boat from um, across to Southampton. Chris Mills, who used to be part of the UK, got this fabulous research way back in about 2000, that the ship had anchored at the Cowes Road, some small tugs were sent to collect the passengers and small items of freight. So Oswald would have been on the Southampton mainland um, at either 7.50 p.m. or 8.40 p.m. Now, Claire's Southampton immigration, we don't know if it's going, and there's an assumption that he boarded, this is a train from the time which went from Southampton to Waterloo. We don't know if that was the 9th or the 10th. Um, and we don't know where he stayed the night, night of the 9th, but what I can tell you, it was a heat wave. 1959 was a drought year. England reached or exceeded 21 degrees, sometimes up to 33 degrees, from September to the third week in October, all the way through this journey. It started out with 23 degrees, finally got to Fort Worth, it was 37 degrees. When it got to Southampton, it was in the high 20s. So, London to Helsinki, this is the controversy period here. Uh, people think that um, the CIA didn't ask to look at the manifest, they did. And they were informed that the documents were destroyed in April 6, 1960. What the Warren Commission wanted was for Oswald to be able to arrive in Helsinki in time to apply for a visa at the Russian Embassy before it closed on the 10th of April. Now, as Chris Mills supplied some uh, timings and alternative flights, but quite honestly, they are irrelevant because even if he got there, he wouldn't be able to get him soon. It's too late. So, now we know more than this now, so let's just move on from there. So then we get, this is, this is where it all went wrong, obviously. Late June 64, the Warren Commission. This is the man I'm holding responsible for 60 years wasted time, Abram Shays, who was a lawyer in the Department of State. So June 1964, they'd finished with the witness testimonies and, and the meetings. They're now writing chapters for the book. And they planned we know from HSC, to publish before the Democratic Convention on the 24th of April. So they're rushing it at this point. Um, and they're reviewing information which had originally been supplied in November 63. And they, they get to the stumbling block. How could Oswald have received his Soviet visa so quickly? They want him to have applied for it on the 10th of October, because if he applied for the 10th of October, that makes it more acceptable. So, Rankin asked Helms, who asked the Department of State, I've looked at all this paperwork, for as much statistical data as possible. Now, I've got an AA level statistics, I love statistics, but instead, supposition. It was absolutely, it is, I, there are hundreds of pages of documents I reviewed for this, it is completely ridiculous. <laughs> they asked three travel agents to consider in 64 what was happening in 59. What? They ignored the evidence to the contrary. So for instance, there was a diplomat who was currently in Moscow who recalled 1959 and said it actually only took two days. They forgot to factor in the fact that it was different for tourists versus business. Oop, didn't occur to him. Um, Chase had been told the Finnish police are without records. You will soon discover that's a lie. And then they went, oh, possibly it took 10 to 14 days, or oh, ordinarily a week. The only person that actually <laughs> spoke sense in retrospect was Jaylee Rankin, who said it may have been only the result of a not infrequent deviation from normal procedures. It was right. 
There was one piece of paper I found that makes a really sensible suggestion. Ask A.E. Ladle. Here he is, Anatoly Galitsyn, age 34. Guess what? He was actually the person signing visas in 1960 in Helsinki, only the year, in fact, months after Oswald had been there. Um, uh, he actually defected the December 61 verse via Helsinki at the American Embassy. From there, he was flown to the US via Stockholm. Now, this is the guy who was loved by James Angles, the most valuable defector ever to reach the West, and by the UK, because we awarded him the CBE, even though he reckoned that Harold Wilson was uh, closely related to the KGB at the time. So the question they should have asked was, well, firstly, put down your vodka. Would your embassy have been open for visas on Saturday, 10th of Saturday? 10th of October 1959, I suggest, yet, because all evidence shows Soviet embassies closed at weekends. So that whole point of trying to get Oswald there for the 10th, he just needed to ask him and he went, he would have said, no, we didn't ever open at weekends. So it's the point is that Oswald couldn't have come to the embassy then. So my other thought was, why didn't Oswald actually def defect? while the Soviet embassy in Helsinki himself, because he would have saved himself hundreds of dollars if he'd done that. Okay, so let's look at uh, what they were told by our UK legal attaché, Bates, who supplied information to the FBI, 8.55 a.m. on the 25th of November. And he tells them, the only direct flight on that day arrived Helsinki 23.33, Sorry, this is in pink, the, the stamp, so it doesn't reproduce very well, but we know, I've got the stamps from when he left Heathrow, I've got the stamps from when he got to Helsinki. Uh, if you think that Oswald didn't know about Helsinki, I have scoured lots of newspapers uh, from California and Texas at the time, masses of stuff about Helsinki into Russia at the time. It was, it was a common way to get there. He would have been... A, Aware of it. All right, so let's follow that. Thin Air Flight 852. Okay, I am now probably the leading authority, having spent several <coughs> weeks on this, on um, Finnish aviation history. I've translated it from the Finnish, I could write a book on it. It's 10.6 <coughs> miles uh, Vantair Airport. <coughs> the first person to actually arrive at that airport was our own Prince Philip. Yes when he arrived for the opening of the Olympic Games. Now, 1964, 1st of July, Helms goes, oh, surely Oswald couldn't have cleared customs 23.33 and got to downtown Helsinki, which he said at that time was a 25 minute drive away by 2400. So, he sent an inquiry via Pan Am, saying it was just a statistical inquiry, remember I love statistics, and he was told by them to wait a week. Never got back to him, actually, because the airport's so busy. Now, why was the airport so busy in 1964? I discovered this guy, it's a name, Kalevi Kayanen, uh, who is a travel agent, was running cut price vodka tours. So it was so cut price, he was taken to court by his rivals. So 64 shouldn't ever be judged by 59 standards because it was a crazy, plus they had an extra hours, uh, sorry, an extra weeks paid holiday at that time. That's another reason why there's more traffic. Um, okay, so what I'm saying, so if you're basing stuff on 64, on you know, the research is gonna be skewed. Put yourself where the time. Okay, so this is one, slide this took me one week of my life to try and construct this i wanted to know how quickly could he have actually cleared that airport this is a picture of the airport see how small the bill it was actually they referred to the clearance area as a shed um, so i started because it's great to get information with air crashes there were two on on these planes from finnair 61 and 63, 
and the number of people aboard. One, of course, the, was down to pilot error. Um, and then I realized the flash of inspiration. They were using Douglas DC-3s. They only had 21 regular passengers. They only had two runways. Maximum, two DC-3s. Maximum people who could have cleared customs at any time would have been 42 passengers and six crew, 48. Remember, this is 11.33 at night, off-season October. Oswald's only got one suitcase and used to pick up your suitcase, see how close it is, walk a few yards and then clear customs. I reckon there were only 20 people. How quickly could he have cleared customs? I reckon 15 minutes. Now, I wanted to make sure, I didn't want to just say to you he got in a cab. So I looked, <coughs> finished, and I found a person just as sad as myself and found out he'd done the history of taxis at help <laughs> simply able I give you. This is a picture of the cab rides at Helsinki Airport. And uh, it's even better. The airport didn't open until 52, but this, tra this um, cabs actually started in 1951 because the, it was, they had to transport the construction crew from jails because the people that constructed the airport were drink drivers. Oh. You could not make this stuff up. So from 52 onwards, they were transporting staff and passengers because only caught a million people cars in Finland, so the staff didn't really have cars as well. So these were a regular thing. Now, Oswald coming out, one suitcase, Okay, finishes. I mean, spoken in Finland, but how to speak Finnish? <laughs> Taxi. There you go. Hostel. <laughs> okay, well, hostel is hostel. There's a problem with hostel if you wanted to go to a hostel. I spoke to the University of Birmingham's world expert on hostels. <laughs> Sadder what? than me. And there was a 10 o'clock curfew. Even if we got in that taxi and said hostel, the guy would have gone, they're closed, mate, you know. Hotel is pronounced hotel. Now you need a hotel that's going to be open at that sort of night, even if it only takes him 15 minutes. I think it could have taken less to get through. I think that's how come he arrived at the tourney, because they needed a ho the hotel that was going to be open at that time of night. So here we are. This is how this... Beautiful. It was here from Ian Griggs' article here. Griggs was here. He visited and learned the register was off in the 70s with a change of owners. Uh, so my, they wanted to know how did Oswald book in it 24 hours, and I'm saying actually he didn't. Um, I'm now thinking at 3 o'clock this morning, he probably got there, he could have got there by 10 past 12. It was, <coughs> even today, it only takes 22 minutes to get to the, this, the hotel. Imagine it at half past 11 midnight. Okay. It's still the same road system. 17, 18 minutes. He could have got there just after midnight. Now I know this, I used to have, believe it or not, have a computer company in the late 1970s. With the introduction of computers, it was common for hotels to booking guests arriving during the night. They would put them down as 24 hours to make sure there wasn't any confusion as to how many days they stayed there. The fact that it actually says 2400, not 2405, not 2359, makes me believe that is the case. Uh, and Holmes, all he had to do was to send a consulate staff member and ask them in June 64. He never did that. I think, as I said now, I believe he probably got there shortly after midnight. You know, Ian Griggs said there was no, nothing there. Yes, there is. I've got this. This is in the Finnish FBI. It's legally, it's not allowed to be released for 60 years. That's the day. So, now I've got those documents and I can look at it. 
Ian Briggs said it's well documented Oswald spent one night at the Hotel Tony. It was room 309 and today room number 308. He didn't, he spent two nights there, Ian. And I can see why they made a mistake. This sensitive source, who I think is the uh, secret police, <coughs> sent this thing and he stayed 10th stroke 11. Now I would read that as 10th and the 11th. However, they didn't look what they did. They put 10th to 11th. So for 60 years, we've had that wrong. He stayed at the hotel for two days. Um, and then he goes to the Klaus Kirky, stays in room 607, now renumbered. Now, the duration of the stay <coughs> is left blank. He didn't know how long he was going to be staying there. And you can see that the writing is actually done by three different handwritings. So it's been updated. These are actually in the, it's not the hotel register, it's the cards that the, anybody who's in the country has to complete for the fact that they're a foreigner. And that's what the Finnish police have held on to for <coughs> years. Now, we know he booked in on the 12th and he's departed on the 15th. This is Ian Gribbs' map in 2000. I'm, oh, I can only believe it was geography because they're all so close to each other. It's only half a mile to the station and there's only 300 yards between the hotel and it's close to the Russian embassy. Um, also, I mean, even though today the, the price is only £114, as an off-season price, um, so it's not perhaps as expensive as you would think the hotels would be. And I'm fully aware that at this time there were lots of affairs and events going on in Helsinki in 59. So I wondered if perhaps the cheaper hotels were full of like construction workers, etc. And perhaps he couldn't book in even if he wanted to. So uh, now I love them. I actually worked with the embassy in Finland in the 1990s and I promoted Saab, um, various other companies, including Finnish licorice. Who mm. knew? So, I thought I'd write about Finland. Obviously, it's got an incredibly small population at this time, four and a half million. It only finished paying the all reparations in 1952. So, it's still building itself back up again. Now, the main trading partners, as I know, are UK, then Russia. This is the scariest thing I think I've ever read. NATO considered it an area not worth defending and not possible to defend, so it planned to bomb its airfields with nuclear weapons to deny the enemy their use. So had, you know, in 62 that happened, Finland would have been bombed to places. The Finnish mapping service, meanwhile, had given the UK 100,000 unpublished photo maps to help them. And whoa! Gary Powers had one of the maps um, to show him where to land. So then not only did the crash sour things with America, it soured relationships between Russia and um, Finland at the time. You can imagine why President Kakonin <laughs> had this uh, pact of active neutrality to, to try and stop this happening. Okay, so we know that Oswald <coughs> in Helsinki on Sunday. I know from uh, a Finnish researcher that it was a lovely sunny day, there were English-speaking movies advertised in the local newspaper, in those days it was about a dollar, and there were also city work walking tours were available. And this is the, hope, this is the film that I found that was actually uh, that weekend on the European release. Right, Spy the Lie. How much money did Oswald have? Really, it comes down to, did he have $1,600 when he started off? And the IRS, um, excellent, best part of the Warren Commission I truly believe in was the fact that it was the forensics on the money. They got this excellent guy from the IRS. He pointed out it was possible from Oswald's salary to have had $1,600. Um, Oswald, did three interviews uh, for many hours with Elaine and Patricia. And one, uh, one uh, I think it was Elaine, was actually printed, it was $1,600 in the 14th of November newspaper. Or, 
did he only have $700 as he towed our customs um, official in Southampton? But he'd already lied to that customs official. He said he planned to stay in the UK for a week. He didn't. He planned to travel to Swiss College. He didn't. Now, you decide. But if he did start with $1,600, I'm calculated he probably had about $1,200 by the time he got to Southampton, which would have been more than enough to pay for flight, hotel rooms, buy his $300 vouchers, and still leave him enough for the next thing we know he's only got $100 balance on the 21st. So there's a comparison. You can buy a car, $1,600, a Ford car, $2,132. $1,600 is a huge amount of money. Gas is only 25 cents a gallon, so travel is pretty, pretty cheap. I suddenly realized that actually I did have a price for how much hotel rooms were. The Hotel Berlin, which you know about, what a glamorous, gorgeous hotel that was, was actually only $3 a night. And Remember, I've got this guy with the Port Authority on hospital. The UK at the time, we were only paying three shillings per night to stay. So, Monday the 12th. Now, the, in these days, the embassy opens at 8.45. If I was Osborne, I would be there pretty damn early. And you're in this chicken and egg situation. You can't get a visa without proving where you're going to stay. So if you're a business tourist, you have to have letters saying that you're going to stay with people. If you're, if you're, just, saying, if you're going to just going to be a tourist, just sent off. You have to get a tourist package, you have to get the accommodation, etc. On top of that, you have, because of the currency regulations at the time, the money you had had to actually be transferred into Finnish currency. So you also have that to deal with. I think that's why he then, late on the 12th, then books into the, uh, the Klaus Kirby. He's not, no, that's why it's, I think it's left blank, because he didn't know, even at that stage, how long the visa was going to take, despite buying this. And I, this shows his blow the budget state of mind, because he bought the deluxe tourist package. That's for 10 days. However, when he did get his visa, that's only for six days. The deluxe means that you just you get a personal guide and chauffeur compared to look the business rates only twelve dollars and I know from Patricia that the her, the same room that he was in if you only went for the room that's only three dollars. Now I also discovered a human mistake at the Klaus Kirky Hotel. I know they stayed in room six oh seven when the vice consul is translating, he writes the information down into Russian. He mistakes Oswald's seven, seven for a one. <coughs> Doesn't that because Oswald didn't put the serif? Personally, I've done it since the age of 11. Who is this person that did it wrong? Okay, I love this man almost as much as Hellbox. I'm calling him Gregarious Gregor. He was called by Low Water a congenial host. Gregoria Yefem, his first two names of Rasputin, by the way, Golub. Now, on the left, we have, this is the CIA. On the right, we have, and I found, actually from clues, found out who it was, worked out who it was, Arthur Jack Low Water. He was one of the world's finest uh, mathematicians and he was allowed to go into Russia because he was doing the Russian English Dictionary of Mathematical Science. Now this, look, oh wow, suddenly. Now, if you ever wonder why uh, Oswald varies in height, because people cannot judge heights. They do not carry these around with them. They are not good at judging weights. To the seeing famous people, this, they're talking just about Gregor. We do know it's chunky, broad face, nice smile, dark hair, dark eyes, Russian or Ukrainian, and I'm completely right. I know more about him than the CIA did, ever did. He was Ukrainian. His father used to be people, people's commissar in Ukraine. We know he was a colonel of the Soviet army, wounded six times, pleasant, <coughs> jovial. In walking, appears to roll along. If you've been wounded six times? Yeah, for us, right. so. Okay, and there's a Mrs. Golub. They've been married for six years without children. 
Gregor gets tears in his eyes when he sees photos of children. Bear that in mind. She's described as attractive uh, by Lowater, and the marriage relationship deteriorates, but the CIA thinks this is a ploy. She's often away from Helsinki in Moscow. Gregor describes their marriage as sham. Once again, the CIA thinks this is uh, a ploy to try and lure people and get people to defect. It's fantastic if you've got time to. There's about 400 documents. <coughs> now, Feb 1959 to March 69, we have this romance. There's the vice consuls, Golab and Costil. And they meet in December 58. And uh, William Costil, it's not his real name, some um, Finnish research thinks that his name is Thomas Cresser, but I can't confirm that. Anyway, his predecessor uh, had nothing to do with the Russians, um, but Castile, on the 18th of February, meets up with Gola for a three hour lunch. Within the next year, they are virtually inseparable. They now they start using the familiar form of language, they use first names, they're going to the Soviet Finnish ice hockey games together, even on weekends. My daughter's personal favourite, their 7th of September Dutch sauna party, and, and yet another favourite. Um, they went for a lunch and Gola told Costil he'd been drinking all evening and hadn't fully sobered up and then ordered vodka and beer. And by the 10th of September, uh, they, they, he's even loaning Golub's colleague American record catalogues. It's going swimmingly. And then he asks Costile to procure him two tickets for the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. This was the hottest thing to happen. It's quite incredible. Um, it was a 50 concert, 17 crunch of three weeks in the USSR. And they were, it was, they were allowed to play music which had been banned for years. This took me about a week to find to get the date. Okay, Costile now have got to procure him a date. So they they CIA approaches an attractive Finnish 31 year old who works for a doctor who could handle the situation. However, CIA puts, she's far from an intellectual with a silly giggle, and he would not be after her mind. So on the 15th of August, Kostil Golub, Golub, this girl and another, go dancing. However, Golub ignores her. Golub asks Kostil later if he can go home with her. Kostil said yes. However, she, having been snub, snubbed, refuses. Golub follows up, don't forget he's married. Several phone calls later, after an intimate dinner in his apartment, he leaves her in his bedroom and gives her his wife's pyjamas. Goes out the room on her return, she is naked, and he exits saying, I just don't work that fast. He then gets involved with A.E. Pawnee. Okay, so this is <coughs> the Redskin program was the uh, intellectual travellers program. Um, anybody that had a legal right, who was bright and intelligent to get into Russia, they're going to try and recruit as a spy. You will notice that Pawnee, a, Pawnee obviously is a, um, a Native American name, so where that came from. Um, now this woman is in Russia as a Fulbright <coughs> student. So after Senator Fulbright set up, has been still going, very bright people, the Nobel Peace Prize winners, Pulitzer Prize winners, anyway. Um, a political historian, I translated all this from the Finnish, actually tracked this woman down to Stanford, but he never names her in his article because she never told her family what she'd ever done. Now she meets him, I think meets as in they planned it, on a train from Leningrad to Helsinki, he's the perfect gentleman. And she starts helping to teach him English. They go for dinners, gift theatre, movies. They, they, that's why I wanted the two tickets for Leonard Bernstein. And CIA just doesn't know what to make of this. They say, we feel that Gola may be suffering from a father complex. Remember that point. 
and they go, is girl up sizing her up for recruitment or is he <coughs> falling for her genuinely? Is he using the Jilted Husband Act? I think this should be a screenplay. So then we get the quickie visa. Bear in mind, all this is happening and it's crescendos up to September 1959. And Golub says, as long as they have a travel plans and hotel reservations, I can give them a visa in a matter of minutes. So Costil tried that successfully on four occasions. And Golub's reason was, since you're allowing Khrushchev, remember Khrushchev's in the country in September in, in doing his tour, to visit the US, there's no reason that I can't let ordinary Americans come to the USSR. So I was a bit worried about how would Oswald, and by the way, he is the only person signing new visas at that time because his uh, assistant has been promoted and gone elsewhere. So we know it's Gola doing it. So Oswald must have met him, and they did sign the form. And I thought, well, they, uh, cost the bromance thing they used to converse in Finnish, but he did, obviously, he spoke Finnish and Russian. However, about this time, he'd been he was being considered for a New York, York consulate position. So he was learning English, not only with a proper teacher, but, remember, A. E. Pawnee. And I love this. So all of this is going, and they're trying, CIA is making all these comments. Is he genuine? Is he not? Is he trying to recruit people? What's he doing? Um, and I found this on the routing sheet. Another reminder that Russians are human. Indeed, they were. Unfortunately, Gulab moved to Moscow on the 7th of February, 1960. And not long after that, he was replaced, remember, with A.E. Ladle. So, Gregor, gone but not forgotten. Now, at this point, it was midnight one night, and I got that, and I was really missing him. I so loved his story. I wanted to find out if, I, if there was anything more I could find out. And I found a report from 1961. Whoa! Gola managed to get a divorce his, because his wife was, it was adulterous. She had been having an affair with a Soviet army officer in Moscow. He'd gone and married a Soviet actress and claimed to be the father of a three-year-old daughter, a deed of which he's apparently quite proud. Remember all the comments about how he got tears in his eyes when he saw kids and etc. It was all genuine. I thought, can I go further? Can I find out who this wife was? Okay. So he married an actress uh, called Lud Miller at the third to Gurgle, and she did next to nothing. However, her daughter's a big star. Born, date of December 1957, popular TV presenter, 60 films, thrice married, worth a lot of money. She, it was the anniversary of her death on Thursday. She was only 54, she was killed in a car crash. The driver fled the scene of the car crash. Um, there was thought to be a massive uh, conspiracy theory in Russia at the time. The fact that obviously she's the daughter of a GRU colonel. Um, she gets a lovely write up from um, Medvedev as how important she is. It was her thing. Um, but the later they did, funny looking bloke, find out um, who had hit her. Doesn't stop there. At the time of her death, yep, this is our Daily Mirror, the actress who said she had fresh details about the murder of Princess Michael's Russian toy boy killed in mysterious car crash. Mikhail Kravchenko, once again, <coughs> don't forget, she's the daughter of a GRU colonel. She probably would know certain things. Um, now, Kravchenko was uh, killed in a... Um, Ten shots with two control, control, control shots to his head. He was worth three hundred. Just that the furniture side was worth three hundred million. He was found dead in his car in 2012. Um, and there was a lot of controversy at the time because Princess Michael was going had been seen out so many times with Kravchenko in 2006. However, the 2014 trial. They managed to jail uh, three of the professional hitmen. One escaped, and guess what? <laughs> Some of the evidence had disappeared, and <coughs> witnesses had been threatened. 
So, in closing, Lee Oswald would have been 80 this Thursday. Gregor outlived his daughter and died in 2014, but he had, has his beautiful granddaughter, Anastasia. And my research shows that unlike all the other Russian and American spies, he was actually using his own name. But at the time, September 59, two Soviet residents <coughs> in Scandinavian countries were very concerned. They thought one out of every three Americans was a spy. Okay. That's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I mean, I've probably got six hours of um, information. If anybody thinks of anything of that period, they want to know. Um, when he got to France, why do, you, why do you think he changed his mind and then came back through Britain? I, it, seems, I, it does seem strange. I mean, he was already in France. I know. It seemed far more but, complicated. To but when you look at Le Havre, and I had a genuine picture of 15, it looks, you know, it, it looks like from the 20s. I don't know to be honest, how, good, how industrial, you know, how good it was to, to be able to get there from Paris. Yeah. I, I suggest, if that was me, um, and I, I was a defector, I did something very stupid, so I have a lot of, that's why I chose this, I have a lot of sympathy. I took some money and waved my family goodbye and departed. I booked the flight as far as I got. I did not know if anybody was going to pick me up. I went to America, I didn't know if anybody was going to pick me up at the station. Um, where I was going, I never to my, my parents died not knowing the truth. And I, the tr I think that's what happened. I think he, he booked so much, and he must have, obviously you would have travel agents or people to ask at the time, so. Or he was directing that. Well, you can think that. You're allowed to think that, obviously. But I think he really didn't know what what to do. Um, Did you find out why he changed hotels in Helsinki? The price. No, well, as I said, he, all right. If you look at the, if anyone wants that particular document, I can send it to you. Be very careful because legally, um, and it's a 60-year thing, but. The, the law is very dodgy as to whether it's 60 years as from when they did the booking form or 60 years as from when they did the investigation, which means it wouldn't be legal until 50 years from 63. Right, so if, when you look at the book, booking forms, um, you can say originally, see that um, he thought he was actually going to spend the first month for five nights. Um, and obviously he only stayed there you know, it was two nights and that i don't know that to me made a bit more sense that you would go because weekends were cheaper yeah. it was cheap and still is cheaper to stay at weekend at a, at a hotel at a weekend than it, because of the fact that helsinki has so many businessmen during the week so i think he must have got this one suitcase and taken that with him to the embassy on the monday morning he wouldn't have known um, really how long it was going to take and then discovered at the end of the day that he, and he can't have known uh, because why would he have spent all that money on 10 days worth of vouchers he, you know he wouldn't have done it if he'd known that, pre, that he was going to have only a six day visa Sounds a bit naive he was 19 yeah you know I, I think, think he was that naive <laughs> I was naive. I was 21. Believe me, I was equally, na I, equally as naive. Your frontal uh, cortex isn't f fully formed until you are 22, and that's the section of your brain that actually dictates uh, the reasoning, the planning, etc. So when you look at teenagers and think they they can't help it. I don't think he was a typical teenager. I think no, he was he a highly intelligent person. Yeah, I think so too. Well, well above his, uh, his, his... Well, he thought he was. That was, that was the point. Yeah. Who's that for 60 years on the documents? That, that the that's just under... No, no, it's just... That's finished law, full, full stop. It was finished law. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's yeah. with the, the, what's the equivalent of the uh, FBI. And um, that's just because it's personal details. Did the CIA try to get this information from the Finns, do you think? Or? 
uh, no, all they asked was Valley 6, who I, I could have been just, just the police, I suppose, the FBI, um, to go and check with the hotel, hence the mistake, 10 of the stroke 11. Um, they don't seem to have had a particularly good relationship um, from all the documents I looked at with the Finnish at the time. Um, otherwise they would have, I don't know, Holmes would have asked better questions. So how was that released? You said it was very recently released. And how did I find it? Yeah. Because I spent weeks um, translating, going through Finnish stuff. I found there was an article in a Finnish newspaper uh, where the, we showed a tiny bit of the document and a, a researcher had, a Finnish re JFK researcher, um, was trying to blow up and he applied to try to get more, that's how I know it's the 60 year thing and they said you couldn't have it. So I thought somebody must have it. Now uh, what also happens with this paperwork is that the person who got it had got proper legal uh, rights to take in photos, uh, photocopies of it. Was this National Archives or something in Finland? No, it, I, uh, yeah, something in Finland. I don't know how, to be honest, I don't know how I managed to find it. But I'm, quite, I'm proud that I did. Mm -hmm. well, does Oswald, did Oswald tell anyone anything else about his time in the UK? No. I, no, he didn't. I, 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 I felt ashamed. I never really read Patricia McMillan Johnson's um, all the testimony, which is ludicrous of me, because she actually did spend hours and hours with him, right till two o'clock in the morning. He uh, didn't tell her anything about London. He just said that he was getting to France. So I just thought um, having to go from Waterloo to Heathrow would have stuck in his mind, negotiating the underground and then the bus from, what is it, from the Hounslow West. But, but, uh, but then, you know, being in a Which country... Which would have taken two or three hours, probably. But, but you know, he'd already, it had already been travelling for, you know, it, it took him 30 days. You know that, he, you know, the, the amount of time he was supposed to be away, he, he couldn't have got there and back in time. You knew that he was it was pre-planned. There's no doubt about it. Anything else? Okay. Well done. Well, where did you get the money from? There's a lot of money he had. Uh, he said that he was so he was so mean that nine out of ten times Del Gargo said when they went to the cinema movies, it was a, which was only a dollar, he would persuade. Delgado to pay for him. That's how mean he was. So that's how he managed, I think, to to say. It. We know all through his life he, he was. Which I said, I can, you can almost see the blow. I, I'm sure I would have been <coughs> the same. You know, he spent all that time. He spent weeks and weeks and weeks getting there. <coughs> it's come to the point when you go. I don't. Know, I just need to get there. I don't care how much it yeah. costs. Yeah. Well, that's how. Yeah. That's how I, I would have been yeah. like. Yeah. <coughs> Anyway, part two is going to be looking at various other defectors that I have found, not only not only Americans, but some Brits at the same time, and it's quite interesting, their journeys, how they got through, there's a lot of people that haven't, I don't think anybody else has followed, and the part I'm going to be doing, uh, planning to do in Canterbury is, um, once again, 1959, it's looking at Webster and Petrulli against Oswald, and um, the differences <coughs> and how what happened, and I've gone really deep into all all those documents. So. Okay. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. have lunch planned for 12.30, so I'm not sure whether lunch has actually been laid out there. I'm just going to go, go and check. Uh, you will be getting a plastic bag with a jammy dodger.